Okay, good morning. So we're working our way through the adventure of different types of hormones and how they are synthesized. Uh, and we left off with the peptides. And the peptides, again, are going to have a gene, so they're coded for in the genetic material. And so they follow the central dogma of molecular biology, which is basically DNA is transcribed to RNA. RNA is translated to protein or amino acid sequence. Now, typically, whenever we have a situation where we're generating a protein, the initial protein that's produced, so I'm going to call this the first protein, is going to be inactive. And so that means that it's going to have no physiological properties. It's actually not going to be able to cause any sort of physiological change, or if it does cause a physiological change, it is not the, the protein's main physiological role. This inactive first protein is typically referred to as a pre-pro hormone. Yes, ma'am. So pre-pro hormone. Now this pre-pro hormone is going to... Oh, I see why you're asking that question, because I kind of have gotten off on my... Does that help? So the pre-pro hormone, it's going to have a first sequence of amino acids. And these first couple of amino acids are actually going to be called a signal peptide. Now, this signal peptide has information in it that will basically say this pre-pro hormone needs to go to the endoplasmic reticulum to be post-processed or needs to go to the Golgi complex to be packaged up to be released into the bloodstream. So this first amino acid signal peptide sequence is going to direct that pre-pro hormone to another uh, organelle within the cell to get further processing completed. What you're looking at here is the processing of insulin. You have pre-pro insulin here on the very far right hand side. And you can see that there's a signal peptide near the amine group on this amino acid chain. And this is going to direct pre-pro insulin to the endoplasmic reticulum where we're going to begin to cleave it. And what you're also noticing here is I have three different chains of amino acids. I have an A chain and a B chain, and then I have this thing called the C chain. Eventually, I have to get to a point where I have the A chain and the B chain linked up through disulfide bridges or disulfide bonds in a final form called insulin. Before I get it to here, I have to go through pro-insulin, which you see you lose your signal peptide, and then we're going to cleave off this thing called the C chain to be left over with the amino, or the <coughs> amino acid uh, sequences of the A chain and the B chain to form our complete or our final insulin molecule. So that signal peptide, most frequently, it is going to guide the pre-pro pre -pro hormone to the endoplasmic reticulum, and there we're going to receive additional processing steps. Now, the processing steps that can occur, we typically refer to those as post-translational or post-transcriptional modifications. So what you're looking at here is you actually can see the ribosome processing a strip of messenger RNA to generate a new protein in a pre-pro form. That pre-pro form has a signal peptide. It binds to a protein, a specialized protein called the signal recognition particle that helps to direct the pre-pro hormone to the endoplasmic reticulum where it gets picked up and pulled inside the endoplasmic reticulum. And then we have enzymes and other proteins that are going to further process this particular protein into its final form. Most commonly, and what you're seeing here, observing here, is we're going to have that signal removed. 
So the signal peptide is removed. This is now going to be referred to as a pro-hormone. Pre-pro hormone has the signal peptide. We remove that. We now have a new hormone or a new molecule called the pro-hormone. And from here, typically, pro-hormones are going to be sent over to the Golgi complex, to the GC. Once they get sent over to the Golgi complex, which you can see here, they come in one side, which is called the cis space of the Golgi complex, and they slowly are moved through the different layers of the Golgi complex all along the way, receiving modifications until they get to the trans space of the Golgi complex, where they are blebbed off into a vesicle, a membrane bound vesicle that now contains uh, large numbers of the individual hormones in their final form. And that's going to be sent out now to the uh, cell membrane. Cell membrane, we're going to exocytose. I don't know if that's really a word or not, but through exocytosis, we're going to release the contents of that vesicle out into the extracellular fluid and then it's picked up by the bloodstream, circulates absolutely everywhere. So what are some of these modifications that happen in the Golgi complex when the pro-hormone arrives? So we're going to modify and package, package specifically for secretion through exocytosis. The modifications that happen, we may bind on a uh, prosthetic group or a carbohydrate. We may fold the protein into its final native three-dimensional conformation. We're going to make all of these modifications to get this pro-hormone into its final active hormone state. Once it's released, picked up by the bloodstream, and now is an active peptide hormone. All right, so shifting gears here a little bit, another important aspect of the endocrine system is transporting or moving the hormones around the organism. So as we're all aware, whether they are steroids or monoamines or peptide hormones, they have to be transported. They are also going to be produced in some source tissue. And then eventually have to make their, make their way to a target tissue. So from the source tissue, hormones are going to be released into the blood and herein lies one major consideration or one major issue that we need solutions to. The blood, as you know, is made up uh, highly of water, has a high water content. That means that the solution is highly hydrophilic. But many of these proteins and steroids and monoamines are actually hydrophobic. So we're going to transport these in a hydrophilic solution, but they are hydrophobic. So the blood is largely water. H2O. So we have to have a solution to this when we actually transport these proteins. Now in reality, if we look at the monoamines and a good number of our peptides, we actually find that many of them are hydrophilic. And if they're hydrophilic, they just simply readily mix with the bloodstream.
And so there's nothing special that needs to be done for these types of hormones. They can just dissolve right into the solution of the blood, the water of the blood, and they can mix in and, and be, just be transported as a solute throughout the organism. <coughs> Excuse me. So the hormones themselves are hydrophobic? Is that what you said? The protein? Well, our means, and many of our peptides are going to be hydrophilic, and so they just readily mix. But the steroids, remember, where are they coming from? They're coming from cholesterol, which is a lipid. Steroids and even uh, some of our other types of peptides, in particular the thyroid hormones, these are going to be much more hydrophobic. So much more hydrophobic, and this is really where the issue comes, because they're not going to mix in. In fact, they're not going to mix into the point where we won't even be able to put them into an aqueous solution if we tried, without some sort of modification. So hydrophilic hormones don't mix with water. So what's the solution? Well, the solution is to make these hormones hydrophilic. So how do we actually go through the process of making these hormones hydrophilic? Well, we associate them with hydrophilic proteins that actually can protect or guard the hydrophobic uh, molecule from the hydrophilic environment, the water environment. These are called transport proteins. And the transport proteins that we're going to rely on, again, are going to be hydrophilic, but will also have the ability to associate with or bind to or collect up any of these hydrophobic hormones. So this image here, you can see that we have tissues and uh, things like the pancreas and the ovaries that are producing molecules and have to react to molecules. Some of these molecules will dissolve directly into the bloodstream and some of them will not. Those that will not, we got to put together with another type of protein that basically removes the effect of the hydrophobicity. Yeah. No, vesicular transport is dealing with movement around the cell, within the cell. We're actually talking about putting this into the extracellular fluid and pulling it into the bloodstream. When you release something like testosterone, it's going to bind up to a protein called androgen binding protein. When it binds up to androgen binding protein, it basically grabs onto it and wraps around it and eliminates the hydrophobic, hydrophobic effect. So you're taking a protein that can mix with water and you're incorporating what doesn't mix well with water, protecting it from the water so you don't have any sort of hydrophobic effects and then it be, it, it's able to circulate. Really, there's nothing changing about the hormone. The hormone's just being getting just a big hug. Just getting a big hug. Okay. okay, so that's the basis for these transport proteins. And really, with transport proteins, we have two major classes. We have the, a class that binds to the steroid hormones in a class that binds to the thyroid hormones. So we'll have transport proteins that bind the steroids, bind the, th the thyroid hormones, and reduce the hydrophobicity, reduce that effect, and then they begin to transport in solution. Now, there are two main types of these proteins, and you've actually probably run into these types before. The two types are globulins and albumins. Okay, so these are 
transport proteins and they're structured in such a way that they either look like a glob or the other thing we call albumin. Both are produced by the liver. And both will bind different types of steroid hormones and thyroid hormones. So when this happens, we can have two different pools of the steroids. Or the steroids, in another term, exist in two states. No, two main types, and two was two main types, three steroids exist in two states. So if we look at the bloodstream, we're going to find that we have steroids that are in a bound state. They're bound up to one of these albumins or globulins, one of these transport proteins, or they exist in a free state. Now, as you can imagine, my free state is going to be hydrophobic. My bound state's going to be hydrophilic. As you can imagine, my free state's probably super low, maybe on the order of uh, nanograms or picograms or even lower. And my bound state's going to be much higher. Most of my testosterone is going to be bound up into the binding globulins, into the transport proteins. However, we have to be able to generate the steroids into a free state because it's only the free state that can cross into the target tissue. So only the free state of a steroid will enter our target. So what does that really mean? It means that we have this small little pool of hydrophilic steroids that are sort of dissolved into the blood. We can dissolve lipids at very, very low concentrations into water. It's pretty difficult to do, but it actually will happen. Everything else, once you reach sort of a saturation point on dissolving the free steroid into the blood, has to be bound up. Otherwise, it's not really going to form uh, or, or dissolve into the bloodstream. So then we get concentration gradients. Right? As steroid leaves the bloodstream in the free state, we decrease the concentration of the free state hormone. That means that the bound state hormones actually can release and enter into that free state population to be extracted from the bloodstream, right? Now, another reason to bind up to a transport protein is this actually can increase the half-life of the steroid or the thyroid hormone. So the half-life is basically the time that it takes for a given molecule to be eliminated by 50%. So if you have 100 molecules of testosterone, the time it takes to only have 50 molecules left because the testosterone has been converted into a new molecule or has been uh, neutralized or, or even ex excreted is going to be the half-life. When you have the molecule in transport, if it is unbound, which again is required so that we can move that steroid or that thyroid hormone to the target tissue, but if it's in an unbound form, it's actually going to be broken down very quickly. Since everybody has this, I'm going to make a slight adjustment. Everybody good? So we can be bound, or unbound rather, or we can be in a bound state associated with a transport protein. Now, when we are bound, unbound, when we're unbound, we may have a half-life of a couple minutes for many of our hormones. When we're bound, 
to a transport protein, hormones can circulate for days to even weeks. So it's going to increase the half-life half -life significantly. Okay, so we sort of know the process of producing hormones, and we know that we have hormone axes. We have the hypothalamus interacting with the pituitary, and pituitary interacting with many of, other, of our other endocrine tissues to cause hormones to be released. We know how they're classified, mono means peptides and steroids. We know a little bit about, about the biosynthesis. We know now a little bit about the transport. But what happens when insulin or some other hormone reaches its target tissue, interacts with that target tissue or the target cell to change of physiology? What's actually happening, in, happening there? The molecular endocrinologist is going to call this the hormone's action. And I'm going to approach hormone action from a generalized standpoint. Really what I'm going to be talking about here is how does a hormone cause a physiological or metabolic change to occur. So there's some commonalities to a variety of different hormones and we're going to generalize it first. And in fact, I'm going to generalize three methods. And these really are three methods of cell signaling that aren't just necessarily related exclusively to hormones. We actually see some of these cell signaling events for other types of, of molecules as well, paracrine molecules, autocrine molecules also. So three methods. The first method should be something that's relatively familiar. Some hormones will work through a cyclic AMP second messenger system. Okay, and we have an image of this that we can work off of. It's specific for norepinephrine or epinephrine, also known as noradrenaline or adrenaline if you're from over across the pond. The cyclic AMP second messenger system we have a receptor that is bound up in the membrane that is going to bind a ligand. In this case, the ligand is epinephrine or norepinephrine. Okay, the specific receptor here is actually a, going to be a beta adrenergic receptor. Doesn't really matter. The generalized idea here, whether it's um, epinephrine or norepinephrine or other types of hormones that can interact through a cyclic AMP second messenger system is that receptor is going to act as a G protein. Now a G protein, what exactly is a G protein? We've actually talked a little bit about that. But a G protein has this uh, G complex that's associated with the receptor itself. Now when the ligand binds to the receptor, that G protein is going to be activated. Remember, whenever we bind a protein, what do we do to that protein? We change its shape. When we change its shape, we change its function. Okay? So I bind norepinephrine or epinephrine to my receptor, changes the shape of the receptor, changes the function of the receptor. That functional change is to go from an inactive to an active state for your G protein. That G protein is now actually going to be in an active state which its whole purpose in life is to activate this enzyme called adenylate cyclase, sometimes also referred to as adenylyl cyclase. Adenylate, think adenine. Cyclase, think turning something into a circle. So adenylate cyclase is going to act on an adenine-containing molecule to turn it into a circle or to cyclize it. We actually have ATP that interacts with adenylate cyclase we lose two of the phosphates, the number three phosphate and the number two phosphate, to be left over with AMP, adenosine monophosphate. Whenever AMP is put into an aqueous solution, like the solution that we have inside of the cell, it goes through a circularization or a cyclization process. The molecule goes from being linear to now being a, a circle. And that's what we call cyclic AMP. So the ligand here is our first messenger. 
Cyclic AMP is going to be our second messenger, hence the name Cyclic AMP Second Messenger System. Now, what does Cyclic AMP do? Well, once Cyclic AMP is formed, it actually is going to interact with the protein kinase. In specific, it's going to act with, uh, interact with the protein kinase called protein kinase A. So cyclic AMP, once it's formed, goes on to activate PKA, protein kinase A. Now, protein kinase, break it apart. What is it? What kind of molecule is protein kinase? It's an enzyme, and how do you know? ASE. It's a protein kinase. So what else do we know about it? What types of molecules is it going to work on or interact with? What's that? It, okay, so it's a kinase, so it's going to phosphate stuff, but what kind of molecules is it going to interact with? Proteins. It's going to phosphorylate proteins. When you phosphorylate a protein, what happens? That protein typically either gets turned on or turned off. Most of the time it gets turned on. It gets put into an active form. So that could be additional enzymes. Or in this case, it could be your funny channel and your T-type calcium channel. Those get phosphorylated. Whenever we bind something to a protein, that protein goes through a conformational change and a functional change. Right. So in this specific case, we're opening up the funny channel. And that allows sodium to rush into the cell. We're also opening up a T-type calcium channel, and that allows calcium to enter the cell. The physiological chain that happens here is we go through a depolarization event. Now, all of this, from protein kinase A through the specifics of what's happening to make the physiological change, is going to be different depending on what type of hormone it is. But it's still going to be using this first part of the pathway, causing protein kinase A to be activated through cyclic AMP. So we could put in another hormone and we could sort of fill in this in general terms and then this would be specific to what that hormone does. And that's what we're going to call the hormones action. So we prime the hormone action through this portion of the curve or, uh, of the um, pathway to protein kinase A activation and then we have the hormones action. So hopefully at some point I'll be able to give you an image, and it may not be epinephrine or norepinephrine, but you'll see things like cyclic AMP and protein kinase A, and you go, oh, that's a cyclic AMP second messenger system, because we're converting ATP into cyclic AMP, we're activating protein kinase A, and then that's leading to the hormones action. So such and such hormone works through a, second messenger, a cyclic AMP second messenger system. Okay, so that's one of them. The next system here, It's called a PIP2 signaling system. PIP2 is going to be converted into a molecule called IP3 and a molecule called DAG. So we have the IP, the, the PIP2 pathway. This is actually going to be a calcium signaling pathway. So we're going to see something happen with calcium. Now, I, I got some stuff here in my notes. I'm going to just kind of take you through this, and then we'll kind of come back and we'll put everything down in the notes. All right, so signaling molecule, our ligand, interacts with another G protein. So this is, a, a, yet again, another receptor that's, that is uh, attached to or interfaced with the G protein. The ligand binds the protein. The protein goes through a conformational change, activating the functions to activate the G protein. Now, we're not with our active G protein not interacting with the denylate cyclase anymore, we're actually going to interact with a molecule called phospholipase C. Now, what kind of molecule is phospholipase C? Phospholipase C. So it's an enzyme, and what molecule, what type of molecule do you think we're going to interact with? What kind of lipids? phospholipids, okay? So once phospholipase C is activated, we're going to go and interact with this phospholipid called PIP2, phosphoinositol uh, biphosphate, or bisphosphate. Really what it is, is it is a lipid, a phospholipid that has a very unique 
phosphate group uh, attached to it, a very unique chemical group. Phospholipase C, it is a lipase, and it is going to break apart the phospholipid. It's going to cut or cleave the phospholipid. When we cleave the phospholipid, I'm left over with two parts. And really what it is is it's the two parts of PIP2. And those two parts are going to be IP3, which you can see the three phosphates here. So this is inositol triphosphate, IP3, and then diacylglycerol, which basically is the leftover legs of the phospholipid. Okay? So I form now two different molecules. This is where the pathway sort of splits. We now have diacylglycerol or DAG that interacts with some molecule. In this case, it's uh, protein kinase C. And we have inositol triphosphate that's actually going to uh, interact with the calcium channel that we would find in the endoplasmic reticulum. Endoplasmic reticulum, just like the sarcoplasmic reticulum of muscle, is a calcium storage depot. Calcium rushes into the cell. Normally, it's very low out here in the cell. Calcium rushes into the cell, increasing calcium levels. Our activated protein kinase C interacts with diacylglycerol and the incoming calcium, and we now have an activated protein kinase C. Protein kinase C. A lot like protein kinase A, it's just a different species. It's going to work with proteins, and it's a kinase, so it's an enzyme that phosphorylates. We start turning on other proteins, and eventually we're going to lead to some sort of chemical response or some sort of metabolic response, cell physiology change. Yes? Is that the same as the DAG? Yeah, that's DAG or DAG, diacylglycerol. Yeah, I'm sorry, that's not supposed to be DAD. I love my dad. Um, but you don't find him in the cell here. Yeah, you notice that there's a lot of calcium going on here, a lot of calcium release, and calcium actually uh, interacting with protein kinase C to, to activate it. Okay, so let's put some stuff here in the notes now that we've kind of gone over this pathway. So DAG activates protein, oops, protein kinases. Now when those protein kinases are activated, again this is going to cause some sort of metabolic event to occur. Right? And there's a I mean, when I'm saying metabolic event, I mean, we're talking like 200,000 different options here. I could be turning on a variety of different proteins and genes. I can be reducing the production of something from the endoplasmic reticulum. I can be preventing intake of glucose. I mean, there's a, just a whole host of things that could be happening here. So DAG, once it forms, is going to cause metabolic event through protein kinase action, and it's protein, specifically protein kinase C. Our IP3 results in a flood of calcium into the cell. Now what's not shown here that also occurs with calcium entering the cell, not only do we have interaction here to enhance the activation of protein kinase C, but we have a bunch of other things that happen that are centered around calcium signal. In particular, as calcium levels rise in the cell, we are going to have activation of a very interestingly named protein called calmodulin. Literally means a modulator of calcium. So we're going to activate calmodulin and some other enzymes. And as we get this calcium activated enzyme pool inside of the cell, we are going to now begin to activate even more protein kinases. And as we get more and more types of protein kinases, we have more and more proteins that can be turned on and turned off, leading towards changes in physiology. And it's supposed to be C, not B.
So this leads to additional metabolic events. A lot of times the PIP2 pathway is also referred to as a second messenger system because you can see that I could almost take this and lay it right over the cyclic AMP messenger system. We have a ligand, we have a receptor, we have a G protein, we have an enzyme that we activate, then we have the metabolic changes that occur. The third signaling system I would like you to be aware of, and there are actually additional signaling systems um, that if we had more time we could talk about, but we're not going to have that time. So we're just going to go through these three, and these are some of the most prevalent three. The third type is called an intracellular reception system. The intracellular reception system is actually going to be the most prominent way in which the steroids, in particular, the glucocorticoids, mineral corticoids, and, and sex steroids are going to cause their physiological changes to occur. Now, we're actually beginning to learn, and over the last 10 or 15 years, we've discovered that there's actually sex steroid receptors that are PIP2 and cyclic AMP acting steroid receptors. Um, but the intracellular reception system is going to be very unique to steroids and it's very unique because the signaling system is going to take place inside of the cell. And the only way that we can have that happen is if we can move the molecule across the cell membrane. Remember, most of our proteins and monoamines are hydrophilic. And so they don't just readily cross the hydrophobic area of the cell membrane. The steroids derived from cholesterol, they're basically lipid molecules, they'll slip right through the cell membrane, can go right through the hydrophobic region of the cell membrane and can enter inside of the cell. So what you're seeing here is our sex steroid that's being produced outside of the cell, crosses the cell membrane and interacts with three receptors that we find inside of the cytosol or even in some cases inside of the nucleoplasm, inside of the solution in the nucleus. So the intracellular reception system, again, this is Commonly used, commonly use this method. The steroids commonly use this method of signaling. But again, we now understand that there are additional ways in which the sex steroids can have an effect, and they can have effects through other G, G proteins. Receptors bond up in the membrane, and so they don't necessarily have to cross the cell membrane in order to have an effect. So the, the steroids are carried in the blood. Again, how are they being carried in the blood? <laughs> yeah, our little big hug. So our transporters are transport proteins. To enter the extracellular fluid to be able to cross the membrane, they got to be freed from that transport protein. Sorry, that's not supposed to be protein. Steroid. The free steroid is going to enter the extracellular matrix through the wall of the capillary. So we permeate through the wall of the capillary, typically through um, the uh, opening, open spaces that we find in the uh, epithelial cells, the, or the endothelial cells that make up the capillary wall. And as they interact with the cells, they enter through the cell and go, the, the steroid enters the cell and goes to the cytoplasm or continues, yeah, cytoplasm or continues to the nucleus, to the nucleoplasm. That's not how you spell nucleus, but you all know what that is. Sorry. So we either hang on in the cytoplasm or we go into the nucleus 
And what we find in these two locations are these sex hormone receptors. Free, not bound up in a, in a membrane, just floating around in the cytoplasm or the nucleoplasm. And the steroid associates with the binding receptors. And they are very specific and there are multiple isoforms. The androgen receptor, right now we know of one androgen receptor. For estrogen, we know of two, estrogen receptor alpha and estrogen receptor beta isoforms. So we may have estrogen enter into the cell and it may bind up to the estrogen receptor alpha and cause a whole sequence of events to happen that leads to a certain metabolic change, or it may bind up to estrogen receptor beta and cause a completely different metabolic change to occur. So the steroid is going to associate with the binding receptor. Now these binding receptors, once they form a hormone receptor complex, so you have the hormone bound to the receptor, these all go and interact with the DNA in the chromosomes. So the binding receptor is activated once it binds the steroid to bind to the DNA. Now the DNA is going to have these short nucleotide sequences that are called response elements. In this case, we're just generically calling it an HRE hormone response element, but we actually have androgen response elements and we have estrogen response elements. AREs and ERES, and these are going to be short sequences of nucleotides on the DNA that actually can interact, allow interactions to occur with a hormone receptor complex. When that interaction occurs, we basically have created what's called a transcription factor. So this hormone receptor complex is going to act as a transcription factor. Now, what exactly is a transcription factor? Well, a transcription factor is just simply a molecule that is going to either activate a gene to be transcribed, so converted from DNA into RNA, or causes a gene that is being produced to be inactivated, to stop the transcription process. So it inhibits a gene's transcription. If I increase a gene's transcription or I decrease a gene's transcription, you better believe that that's going to lead to a change in protein, and that's going to lead to a change in physiology. That change in physiology, I'm just simply going to refer to as a metabolic event. So a metabolic event will occur or take place. Um, what is, uh, Inactivated. It's pretty close. So A says that we are going to activate a gene to be transcribed or we're going to activate gene transcription. B says we're going to inactivate gene transcription. When we do those two events, either one we do, it's going to change the cell's metabolic activity. Everybody have this. <laughs> okay, so we've just gone through three potential signaling systems. There's actually a few more. And all of them have ended in sort of this monolithic, uh, nondescript, we have a metabolic event. So what are those metabolic events? And we're going to look at it on the basis of per gland. So each of our endocrine glands are going to produce a specific hormone. We go through all of this stuff that we've just talked about. We have to synthesize it. We have to transport it. We have to release it. We have to get it to the target tissue to cause a metabolic event to happen. So from a specific gland to a metabolic event, what are the really the, the major end results? 
And we're going to do this on a gland for gland basis. And we're going to start out with this sort of interesting gland called the pineal gland. So the pineal gland is actually near the base of the brain, not too far away from the pituitary and the hypothalamus. A little fun factoid here. We used to actually believe that this is where the soul that we talked about in the Bible actually resided, was in the pineal gland. And obviously, there's probably not much of a reason to believe that. But the pineal gland produces a hormone that's called melatonin. And melatonin, in all reality, is sort of an unknown hormone. The actions are somewhat uncertain. But what we can surmise is they probably are going to be involved in circadian. Let me respell that because that's not even close to being right. Circadian rhythms. I'm going to put a question mark there. And also may be involved in sexual maturation. And we'll put a question mark there. So what you're seeing here, hopefully you're beginning to recognize some things. We have a bunch of stuff that's happening here. And you'll see that we actually have norepinephrine, and we have uh, the suprachiasmatic nucleus and the paraventricular nucleus. And there's all kinds of things that are happening that are leading towards these two receptors, the beta receptor and the alpha receptor. These are adrenergic receptors. And we find them located on this thing called a pinealocyte, or a cell of the pineal gland. Then all of a sudden we have our good old friend, cyclic AMP. So just to release melatonin and to cause other intracellular actions, we're going through a, uh, a second messenger, cyclic AMP second messenger system, and you'll notice that we have to take up tryptophan, an amino acid, and we're going to convert it through a bunch of different uh, um, uh, sub uh, substances until we get finally get to melatonin. Melatonin may actually have some effect on the pineal site itself, but then it's released into the bloodstream, circulates everywhere, and its action may be circadian rhythms and sexual maturation. The next gland I'd like to hit on here is the thymus. The thymus produces three hormones. Thymopoietin, thymosin, and thymolin. I didn't mean to do that. So thymus, thymoleaton, thymosin, and thymolin. Now, all of these are actually going to be involved in regulating a group of immune cells, immune cells called the T cells. So regulates the T cells. It's, uh, they're going to be involved in the maturation process and, and the production process of T cells, which are involved in the immune system. So we'll actually come back and we'll take a look at T cell function and maturation uh, when we talk about the immune system. All right. The last thing we'll talk about today will be the thyroid. The thyroid's pretty interesting. Thyroid requires iodine. It's one of the reasons we iodize salt or put iodine into your table salt that you uh, cook with and, and have uh, as a seasoning on food. The thyroid produces two similar hormones. They actually come from a, a same metabolic source or same protein source, source, I should say. One of them is thyroxine, which is called T4. 
and the other is called triiodothyronine. I can spell this right. Triiodothyronine. Or, as biologists like to do, T3. So T3 and T4. These hormones are released. One of their main metabolic effects is to increase metabolic rates, things like heat production and oxygen consumption. So with thyroxine and triiodothyronine, we're going to have an increase in oxygen consumption, and we're going to have an increase in heat production. When we come back, because I'm actually over, we will pick up with a third thyroid hormone called calcitonin, which we've already interacted with in the past. O2 consumption.